Let us pray. Our Father, we come to acknowledge your greatness. And Father, we are asking that this particular time the Holy Spirit will shed light on what we study and read from the Word of God. And Father, we pray that the Word of God will reach out to us and benefit every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray that, Lord, as we study the Bible, study the Word of God, you will bring us closer, nearer to yourself. Help us to be sincere with ourselves and sincere with what you are revealing to us from the scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray. In our study of Acts of the Apostles, today we want to concentrate on seeing some aspects of the lives of some of the men that God used in the New Testament to build up the early church. And as members of the ministry of this church, as well as workers together in a vineyard, you want to consider these qualities in the lives of the people we're revealing to you. So that you will see what we ought to be if we're, in the, if we're going to be in the position where God will make use of us. In Acts chapter 2, reading verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. From that point, Peter began to speak. He began to preach. And at the conclusion of the message, we find in verse 37, Now, when they, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? In verse 41, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Peter was mightily used of God. And today there are many people that desire to be mightily used of God like Peter of old time. But then, what did Peter do? How did he yield himself to the Lord? What were the qualities in his life that made him to be so used of God? That's the reason we're here tonight. To be able to see what qualities ought to be in our lives so the Lord can use us in a mighty way as well. Let me show you another man. In Acts chapter 6, I'm reading verse 8 and verse 10. And Stephen, full of faith and of power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. That's another man that the Lord used mightily in the early church. Now in Acts chapter 8, verse 5 to verse 8. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed, gave attention to, unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For the for unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that, that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. God used Peter. God used Stephen. God used Philip to publish the gospel. And to make many to come into the kingdom of God. But there were qualities in their lives. There were things that God saw in their lives. And as we reveal these things from the scriptures tonight. I'm praying that what the Lord did in them and through them the Lord will do in us and through us as well. In Acts chapter 9, from verse 27, But Barnabas took him, referring to Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, and brought him to the apostles, and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly, at Damascus in the name of Jesus 
and he was with them, coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake the word, he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians. But they went about to slay him. Which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea, and sent him forth to Tarsus, then at the church's rest. Throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, they were multiplied. I have shown you just these four men, Peter, Stephen, Philip, and Paul. God used them. And today the Lord is looking for men that he will use. In every mighty move of God, in every great thing God has done, God has always used men. He may use um, instruments. He may use the rod, but the rod will have to be in the hand of Moses. He may use the jawbone of an ass, but the jawbone of an ass will have to be in the hand of Samson. He may use a stone to, dis, uh, to slay Goliath, but that sling containing the stone will have to be in the, in the hand of a man called David. He may use the singing of an individual. It may be the singing that drives away the devil from Saul, the first king of Israel. But the singing and the music will be coming from the harp of a man. There is always a man behind the great move of God. God is always picking up a man that he will use. But there will be men that are approved of God, men that are sanctioned by God, men that are close to God and near to God, men that have no sin in their lives. Let me show you just seven from the scripture. David was mightily used of God to fulfill the purpose of God in his own generation. But you know what the Bible calls him? A man after God's own heart. Elijah was a man that was raised up. Elijah the Tishbite. He was raised up at the time that Israel needed a revival. They needed somebody to move them and bring them to the side of the Lord again. You know what he was called? He was called a man of God. Elisha took over from him. Elisha was a person that took his room. Elisha was a person that moved the people with the miraculous hand of God. But you know what the Bible calls him? A holy man of God. Daniel was used in Babylon by the Lord God Almighty to bear his testimony that even that Babylonian uh, empire will be able to know that God in heaven is the only true God. But you know that Daniel was a man in whom there was an excellent spirit. Paul was used of God. And God testified about Paul saying, He is a chosen vessel unto me. Talking about John the Baptist. The apostle John in the gospel according to St. John wrote about him and said there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And Jesus Christ who came for redemption, when Nicodemus came to him, he said, Thou art a teacher, come from God. So then you understand. All these men, in ages past, all these men that God used, they were men after God's heart. They were men of God, holy men of God, men in whose, uh, in who there, in who there was uh, uh, excellent spirit, men that were sent from God, from the very presence of God. They were chosen vessels and they were come from God. God will only show himself strong and mighty in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. So if you want to be used of God, one, you must get saved. Because you cannot be a man after God's own heart if you are not saved. You cannot be truly called a man of God if only salvation is what you know. You must get sanctified. The power of God, the, word, the blood of Jesus must cleanse your heart and sanctify you. And you become a real man of God. You must be baptized in the Holy Ghost. You must be so linked with the Lord that the Spirit of God fills you, indwells you, comes upon you, and come, flows out of you rivers of living water. Many churches today, they're looking for messages, methods, machines, or notable meetings. For them, if they can get in a preacher, a traveling preacher, to give them nice messages, they feel that the church will grow. The church will develop. But you know, behind a nice message, there must be a nice man. If the message is nice and the man is not nice, 
If the man is not saved, if the man is not having the spirit of God, if the man is not sent by God, the message may be nice. It will not build up the church. It's not just novel methods, new methods. You can import some methods from America, from Japan, from various places in the world and try to build the church. Novel methods must not do it if the men that are using those methods are not spirit-filled. It's not messages alone. It's not methods alone. It's the man. God is looking for a man that he will use. You know, there are people that are getting new machines, instruments they can use. And they feel that if they just have these gadgets and instruments and machines, that the church will grow. The church will be developed. Listen to me. The Lord doesn't, an doesn't anoint an organ. The Lord does not put the spirit upon a violin. The Lord does not put the spirit upon a microphone. It is a man playing the violin. It is a man playing the organ. It is a man speaking before the microphone that is using the microphone. It is a man that is anointed. It is not the machine. We may have new machines. If we are not anointed of the Holy Ghost himself, the work will not be done. You know, there are people that are looking for notable meetings. They gather people together. They call it by a new name fresh name every time so as to bring people to come you don't build uh, the church by just having notable meetings if the men are not new and renewed in the spirit the church will not be built if you want to be used of god if you want the lord to make use of you in a growing church for the lord to do what he did through peter or stephen or philip or paul you must become a renewed man churches want more money you know there are churches that are crying for money all the time they say God has given them a great work to do. Only if they can have more money, the work will be done. Listen to me. God is not looking for more money. He's looking for matured men. If the money is there, but the men are not there. If the money is there, but the maturity is not there. If the money is there, but anointed men, spirit-filled men, able to carry the message of God. If they are not there, the work of the church will not be done. It's not money. It's not method. It's not a meeting. It's not machine. God is looking for men. Men that will carry on the work of God today. God needs men. Men who are saved. Men who are zealous. Men who are self-denying. Men who are self-emptying. Men who are clothed with humility. Wise as serpents. Harmless as doves. Simple as children. Compassionate as a savior. Strong in faith. Not staggering at the promise of God. Listen to me. God created Adam. Through Adam, he wanted to subdue the whole earth. He needed a man that he put in the garden of Eden. When Adam failed, God chose Abraham. That will be able, through him all the families of the earth will be blessed. God needed a man. You remember that before, uh, before Abraham, God chose Noah. Because God, Noah was the man that had found grace in the sight of the Lord. He needed a man all the time. You know that God raised Joseph from the prison to come and talk to Pharaoh. And to come and rule in Egypt. God always needed a man. God selected Moses. At the backside of the desert, the bush was burning but not consumed. And Moses turned aside and said, I will look at this site. What is this all about? And then when he turned aside, God called him, Moses, Moses. I have seen the affliction of the children of Israel. Come, I will send you to them so that they will come and worship me on, upon this mountain. God always needed a man. You remember after Moses, God selected Joshua. A man who totally followed the Lord, wholly followed the Lord with Caleb. He was the man that led the children of Israel from the wilderness into the land of Canaan. God always needed not a method, not just a message, not just machines, not just meeting, not just money. He needed men, anointed men, men that are obedient to the Lord. And when the time of David came, God said, I have found a man after my own heart. He shall rule over my people Israel. And he called that man and he used that man. And God used many other men in the Old Testament. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and other prophets of God. God was always looking for men upon whom he will pour his spirit and he will use them mightily. You come into the New Testament and John the Baptist used of God. Peter, James, John, Paul, Barnabas, Silas, many people used of God. God has always been looking for men. But today, many people in the church feel that it's just the methods, not the men. 
and they're always trying to modernize the method they're all always trying to change the methods they're always trying to improve the methods if you improve the methods and the men are not improved the church will not grow if you try to get a new message but the, a nice message but the men are not renewed they are not empowered the, the church will not grow now you think about it how do you want to be used of God if you want to be used of God like these people in the Old and the New Testament, you must present yourself to God as a person that willingly yields to the Lord and the Lord will be able to use you. The man who really is approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed is a man that is needed today. Such a man is authority, the authority of his faith and prayer will lock and unlock will bind and lose. He is a man of God whose soul is ever following hard after God. His eye is single to God. He is crucified to the world. The world is crucified to him. He is energized by the Spirit and rivers of living water flow unhindered out of his belly. He is truly the temple of the Holy Ghost with the fruit and the gifts of the Spirit in evidence. He is constantly keeping his first love to God, to Christ, to the church, and to mankind. is fully consecrated to God and his service. And he binds his sacrifice upon the altar. Such men, such men, and only such men will be mightily used of God. You know, many, many times you'll find a person that just gets saved and then he grabs his Bible and he says, I'm an evangelist. Or you find somebody that gathers two or three people together, 20 people together, and he says, I'm a pastor. Sometimes you'll find people that gather some people together and they say, I'm a teacher. Other people call themselves apostles. They do not have the qualities, the qualification, the character, the courage, the charisma. They have nothing of the qualities in the Bible that will make them to be what they ought to be. Listen to me. There is no cheap and easy way to make uh, the church grow. You cannot just rise up and take your Bible and say, well, I'm a minister of God. I'm evangelist so and so. How about the qualities that God is looking for in a man of his own choice? The minister or the member who will be used in a growing church must be yielded in God's hand as clay in the potter's hand. He's always busy. He must be about his father's business. The life call from the altar of God as touch his lips because of that is purged is inflamed, is renewed, is sanctified, is anointed, is empowered. He prays and he praises. He sings and he speaks. He cannot be quiet. He cannot hold his peace. The word of God is burning within him. Raising up a growing godly church is not the work of lazy, careless, indifferent, worldly men. If you are going to be used of God, many times you'll be with the Lord all night in prayer. Many times you'll rise up a great while before the day like Jesus did and you will pray. Many times daily you will give yourself continually to pray and to the ministry of the word of God like the apostles did. There is a price to pay and only those who pay that price will be able to get into the move of the Lord and be used of God mightily. It is to such men saved, sanctified, spirit-filled, supplicating, praying to the Lord, steadfast. It is to such men, men that are serious, men that are zealous, men that are self-denying, self-emptying, humble, gentle, men that have the qualities, the gifts, and the fruit of the Spirit. It is to such men God commits the keys of his kingdom. And he will be able to open and sinners will come in and he will get converted, he will get saved. He will be able to open and believers will come into the unsearchable riches of the kingdom of God. Because this man has yielded himself, surrendered himself and is able to preach the gospel with power, with anointing. I want to show you eight specific things necessary in the life of a person who wants to be mightily used of God, in the hand of God. Eight things. Number one prayer secret prayer number two purity searching purity number three power spiritual power number four persuasion strong persuasion number five preaching scriptural preaching number six purpose a saintly purpose 
Number seven, perception, spiritual perception. Number eight, principles, sound principles. It is to men of secret prayer, men of searching purity, men of supernatural power, men of strong persuasion, men of scriptural preaching, men of saintly purpose, men of spiritual perception, and men of sound principles that God will commit the keys of the kingdom. They can lock and unlock. They can bind, they can lose. They can draw sinners into the kingdom to get saved. And they can put the devil on the wrong. But you cannot get into all these eight things if in your life you are not serious with the law. Let's take the first one. Men of secret prayer. They are always on bended knees before the Lord. They know what it means to come to the altar of the Lord and to pray and to seek the face of the Lord. They have already saw the face of the Lord and they are saved. And from the time the Spirit of the Lord is calling in their hearts, Abba, Father, they continue to pray. They continue to call upon the Lord. They are holding on to the promises of God. They are standing upon the promises and they cannot fail. When sickness comes, they pray. When they are approaching sinners, they pray. When they are witnessing, they pray. When they, when they meet a person that is suffering, they pray. And when they pray, because they are men of secret prayer, the Lord is answering their prayers. If you want to be used of God, there must be this number one thing in your life after you are saved. You must be men and women of secret prayer. In Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. From verse 1, and he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray, always to pray, always to pray, and not to faint. When you are happy, always to pray. When you are sad, always to pray. When you are persecuted, always to pray. When you are promoted, always to pray. When you are suffering, always to pray. When you are happy, when you are joyful, always to pray. When you are in church, always to pray. When you are at home, always to pray. It is to such men who in all circumstances, at all times, they know the power of secret prayer. Those are the people that God will use in a mighty way. And in this church... You want to be used of God. Everything you do must be bathed in prayer. If you're a house fellowship leader, if you're a zonal leader, if you're preaching the gospel, if you're singing, if you're an usher, whatever you do must be bathed in prayer. Because it is to such men of secret prayer that the Lord will be able to use in a mighty way. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 6, verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The apostles decided, they determined, that because they wanted God to use them, they were going to give themselves continually, wholeheartedly, to the ministry of praying. When we pray, the Lord moves in mighty ways on our behalf. Number two, you must be men of searching purity. You know, when you get saved, you have the peace of God. It is when you get sanctified, you have that inner purity, inner holiness, holiness of heart. And the type of purity I'm talking about is not the type of purity that only appears on your dressing. I don't smoke, thank God. I don't drink, thank God. I do not go to immoral people out that is wonderful, but I'm talking of something deeper. I'm talking of something that will take you to get on your knees and consecrate yourself to the Lord and say, Oh Lord, here am I. Purify my heart, sanctify my heart, uproot the Adamic nature, and God will give you a type of holiness and purity that when people see you, they'll have a taste of heaven. They'll desire heaven. When people see you, they'll be thirsty. They'll be hungry after righteousness. Because your life is the salt of the earth. Your life is the light of the world. There is such a transparent holiness, transparent righteousness, and transparent purity. And your life will be, a convi will be convicting other people. Your life will be searching other people. Men of searching purity. In uh, First Te Thessalonians, let's look at the testimony of the Apostle Paul. First Thessalonians, chapter two, in verse ten. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we have behaved ourselves among you that believe. 
as a man of such impurity. And he told the people, you have seen my manner of life. And God also is a witness. How holy, how just, how unblameable the Lord has enabled them to be able to walk in the midst of these Thessalonian Christians. In First, Thess in first Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in faith, in spirit, and in purity. If we're going to be used of God, we must not only stay at the level of salvation, we must go further, be sanctified. And there must be a continual searching purity of life in our lives. Everywhere we go, private or public, there must be purity. Because we're not living a life of holiness, righteousness, or purity just for men to see us. Some people are hypocrites. If all you do is to live right in church and live in a bad way outside, that's hypocrisy. But you know, if you want God to really use you, you will be a man of such impurity. Whether it's in private or in the public, you're living a life of holiness unto the Lord. Not only that, if you are going to be used of God in a mighty way, if you are going to be used of God in a growing church, if you want to be able to walk along with Christ, with God, if God is, is going to confirm your ministry as you are preaching the gospel, as you are helping people, as you are counseling people, as you are involved in one area of the work in the church or the other, you must be a man of supernatural power. One, secret prayer. Two, um, searching purity. Number three, supernatural power. Without it, you cannot do much. You know, the apostles had been with the Lord for a long time. For more than three years. And the Lord wanted them to do a great work for him. And yet, before he went away, he told them, Tarry in Jerusalem, until ye be endued with power from above, from on high. That's what I'm telling you. That if you are going to be used of God, you must be a man of supernatural power. Listen to me. There are many people that go to Bible school. All they learn, they learn Greek, they learn Hebrew, they learn the ancient languages, and they learn interpretation of the Bible, but then there is no fire of the Holy Ghost within them. There is no power of the Holy Ghost within them. There is no anointing of the Holy Ghost upon them. There is no dew of heaven, the rain, the latter rain of the Holy Ghost upon them. All they come to preach is a dry theology. They can talk Greek. They can talk Hebrew. Greek will not scare the devil. Hebrew will not scare the devil. It is the power of the Holy Ghost that puts the devil on the run. It is the power of the Holy Ghost that confirms the word when you are preaching the gospel. The Bible says the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And if you are going to really preach the gospel, if you are going to be used of God, if, you, if your ministry in this church is going to be blessed of God, you must be a man of supernatural power. You must be a woman of supernatural power. There must be secret praying. There must be searching purity. There must be supernatural power. Not only that, you must be men and women of stronger persuasion. What do I mean by that? I have met Christians who are not strongly persuaded in them. Now, sometimes they say, well, I thank God I'm saved. The next week they say, well, I'm not really very sure whether I'm saved or not. They are not men of strong persuasion. But Paul the Apostle said, I know whom I have believed. And I know that what I have kept in his son is able to keep until that day. Paul the Apostle was a man of strong persuasion. Anywhere he went, he said, who, the God whom I serve. He knew he was a child of God because the Spirit of God bore witness with his own heart that he was a child of God. Now, if you are not persuaded of your salvation, if you are not sure of your salvation, if you are not certain of your salvation, you cannot be a man of strong persuasion. And if you are going to be used of God, you must be men and women of strong persuasion. Not only that, 
Do you know there are people that are unstable in the teaching of the doctrine of the Bible? In 19, if you saw them in 1981, they'll say, well, I believe you must be saved, you must be sanctified and baptized in the Holy Ghost. You saw them in 1982, they say, well, I believe you must be saved as for sanctification. I don't think that is necessary anymore. And if you meet them in 1985, the restitution they believed in 1981, they do not believe it today. They are not strongly persuaded as to the doctrines of the Bible. God cannot use those who are unstable, those who are not standing with the doctrines of Christ, those who are not standing on the teachings of the scriptures. If you are going to be used of God, you must be men of strong persuasion. You must be able to know that there is no other gospel. You must be able to know that if an angel or any apostle come to preach any other gospel unto you, let him be a cause. You must be able to know that what we have believed, what has been committed into our hands, is a sure, certain gospel. And you contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. You are a man of strong persuasion. And you believe the whole Bible from cover to cover. You don't remove out of it. You don't add unto it. You believe that every word of God is inspired by God. And you stand upon all the word of God. Those are men of strong persuasion. And if you are going to be used of God, you must be men and women of strong persuasion. Listen to me. If you are going to be used of God, you must be men of secret prayer. You must be men of searching purity. You must be men of supernatural power. You must be men of strong persuasion. Not only that, you must be men of scriptural preaching. Have you ever listened to some preachers? They never refer to the Bible. They just tell you fables. Old women's fables. Stories. The news they have read in newspapers is what they come on the pulpit to share, to talk to the people. The news say, the news will never convert anybody. Fables will never convert anybody if you are going to be used of God. God is going to be able to see that you are a man, you are a woman of scriptural preaching. Because God never confirms fables, stories. He can only confirm the word of God. Look at Mark chapter 16, verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord walking with them and confirming the word with signs following. God will not confirm the noise with signs following. God will not confirm the fables with signs following. God will not confirm just stories, cheap stories, senseless stories that we tell on the pulpit with a science following he will only confirm the word he will confirm the word if you are a man of scriptural preaching if you stay with the word of god if you stay with the word of god the lord will be able to confirm that word you remember what paul told young timothy by the time he was going away he said timothy i charge you before god and christ i charge you that you must preach the word preach the word preach the word in season and out of season why because that is what God will confirm. If we are not preaching the word, there is nothing to confirm. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Acts chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. That is it. If we're going to be used of God like these men of old, we must preach the scriptures. But listen to me. Can you preach what you have never read? Can you preach what you don't know? If we're going to be men of scriptural preaching, we must be men who spend hours studying the Bible. We must be men who eat the word of God, swallow the word of God, take in the word of God every day, regularly. And we must be people that actually know that word and have uh, lived our lives according to that word. It is what you have read. It is what you have heard. It is what you have known. The Holy Ghost will be able to bring to your remembrance when you have read that thing before. He'll bring it to your remembrance when you need it. We must be men of scriptural preaching. Not only that. We must be men of saintly purpose. You must determine your purpose. 
I was um, talking with people who came to worship with us yesterday in London. Because we had a first a Sunday worship yesterday. And I was telling them about true worship. Telling them there are many people that argue about the place of worship. Like the woman that was sitting at the well of Samaria. And arguing about which place shall we worship, which place shall we worship. But I was telling them that it's not the place for us. Number one, you must think of the purpose of worship. Why are you here? Why are you in this particular church? Why are you listening to the word of God? Why are you giving your life to the Lord? Why do you want to worship the Lord? There must be a well-defined purpose. And if the people are not defining and determining the purpose while they are, while they are worshipping, the place of worship is not the first thing. The first thing is the purpose of worship. I was telling them about the pattern of worship. Because many people do not know there is a scriptural pattern in worshipping. And you know, they just come to church, they jump, they dance, they roll on the ground, they do everything, they, they do many, many things, and they do not find out from the Bible what is the true pattern of worship. I told the people yesterday, and I'm telling you today as well, you must determine the purpose and the pattern of worship. I also told them the purity in worship, because God called the people and he said, you worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And if there is no purity in worship, there is no worship at all. Because the Father is seeking those that will worship him to worship worship in spirit and to worship in truth i also told them the right person to worship the purpose the pattern the purity the person to worship but you know many people all they think about is just the place of worship they don't think about the pattern they don't think about the purity they don't think about the person they are worshiping they do not think about what the lord wants there is no purpose that is deep seated in the heart and as you are here today you want to understand that if you want to be used of God, there must be a saintly purpose. I mean, just coming in here as a place of worship, not having a purpose deep down within your heart, that will not do. Why are you here? Why are you studying the Bible? Why do you want to work for God? Why do you want to serve the Lord? Do you have a purpose of getting to heaven? Do you have a purpose of doing the will of God? Men who are going to be used of God are people of saintly purpose. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. What a purpose. Paul said, my determination, my purpose is that all I want to know as I preach, as I pray, as I worship, as I mix in fellowship with the children of God, all I want to know is Christ and him crucified. That's a saintly purpose, not a selfish purpose. You know there are people that are preaching because of money. That's not a, that's not a saintly purpose. That's selfish. You know there are people that are preaching to be popular. That's not a saintly purpose. You know there are people that are working in the church so they can be known. That's not a saintly purpose. What's your purpose? If you are serving the Lord, if you are worshipping the Lord, if you want to be used of God, do you have a saintly purpose? Because, listen to me, the men that will be used of God in the age and in the day that we are, they are men of saintly purpose. They are determined to know nothing, nothing, except Christ and Him crucified. Not only that, they are men of spiritual perception. Spiritual perception. You know, it is easy for you to be deceived if you don't have spiritual perception. Now you think of yourself as a pastor. And think of uh, the situation where a woman, a lady came after Paul and said, These are the men of God who preach unto us, who tell us the way of the Lord, the way of salvation. And that woman was speaking out of a spirit of divination. But if you don't have the spirit of perception, if you are not a man, of, a man of spiritual perception, you know what? You'll make that woman a worker. A woman having a spirit of divination. You'll make her a worker because you do not have spiritual perception and you will ruin the work of God. Remember the case of Peter? He came to the Lord Jesus and he said, Oh Lord, I'm so determined, I'm so consecrated, if it needs dying, I will die for you. 
But Jesus had spiritual perception. And Jesus said, You will deny me three times before the cock crow. You know, if you don't have spiritual perception and you are working for God, you will be raising up workers that are self-confident and self-sufficient but are not really able to stand by their consecration. It's important that if you are going to be used of God, you must be on your knees and the Lord will give you spiritual perception. Not only that, if you are going to be used of God, you must have sound principles. Sound principles. And I'm talking about the principle of honesty. The principle of sincerity. The principle of living a transparent life. The principle of being trustworthy and dependable. I'm talking about the principle of doing unto others as you want them to do unto you. I'm talking of the principle of living such a consistent Christian life. Whether you're in the public or you're in the private. If you don't have those sound principles of living, you will never amount to anything in the sight of God. If you are going to be used of God, you must have sound biblical principles. Look at uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. If you don't have sound principles, you'll want to retaliate. You'll want to fight back. You'll want to abuse back. But if you are going to be used of God, you must be men of sound principles. Keeping your cool, keeping your temper, whatever other people say against you, whatever they do against you, you recompense to no man evil for evil. You provide things honest in the sight of all men. Let me ask you this question. As you are eager to be used of God, as you are eager to serve the Lord, are you saved? Are you sanctified? Are you baptized in the Holy Ghost? Are you seriously seeking after the Lord? Or are you just lazy, selfish, careless, indifferent, and worldly? These eight things I've been talking about, the qualities and the characteristics in the life of people who are really seeking after the Lord. Do you have them? Are you a man of secret prayer? Are you a man of searching purity? Are you a man of supernatural power? Are you a man of strong persuasion, of scriptural preaching, of saintly purpose and spiritual perception and sound principles? If not, why not? We can be what we ought to be. If we're serious before the Lord, we can go before his altar. We can say, oh Lord, here am I. I consecrate my all unto you. I bind my sacrifice upon the altar and I will not let you go until you bless me. I will do what you want me to do. And as you get all these qualities in your life, the Lord knows when you are ready, when he has qualified you, and he can make a strong, dynamic instrument out of you. The Lord needs men. You can present yourself before the Lord, and the Lord will have a chance of using you. Rise up and let us pray. Give yourself to the Lord. Examine your life. With these things you have heard tonight, don't take it with a light hand. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. I saw secret prayer, prayer life. Do you know how to pray? Are you seeking the face of the Lord? How about your purity? Are you pure within and without? Pure in heart, pure in conscience, pure in affection, pure in your motive, pure in every way, pure in the private, pure in the public. Are you pure? Do you have the supernatural power of God? Check up. Don't take for granted. Check it up. Is the fire, the anointing, the spirit of God upon you? Are you seriously seeking after the Lord? Zona leader, area leader, house fellowship leader, member of this church. Are you seeking after the Lord? Has he empowered you? Are you of strong persuasion? Do you really believe what you say you believe? Are you unshakable in your conviction? God will only use men of strong persuasion. 
high about your purpose in life, the principle on which you live. Check up. 